Amen. Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord. I was Amen. glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of worship and to the house of prayer. Amen. I thank God that he's allowed me to be right here in the land of the living. I thank him for allowing me once again to be in the house of worship. I don't want to take anything for granted. Over the last couple of weeks, we wasn't able to make it out. So many things that come has came against us, but the Lord has seen fit for us to be here today, and we Amen. give Him praise today. Amen. Somebody said that you could have been on uh, Facebook or you could have been on YouTube, and so I replied, "So I'd rather be in the house of the Lord, Amen. you know." And so He's allowed us to be here today, and so we're grateful. So I will open up with a quick prayer. Father, we thank you for another opportunity to come into your presence. Yes. We do thank you for your grace and for your mercy, Lord. Yes. We do thank you, Lord, that you allowed us to rise this morning, Lord, with the activities of our limbs. And we thank you this morning, Lord. We thank you that you've allowed us to come out to the house of worship, that we can hear what thus said the Lord. God, we thank you, Lord, that we're on our post this morning, and we give you praise this morning. We give you glory. We give you glory this morning. We magnify you, Lord, and we lift you up this morning, Lord. Oh, God, we don't take you for granted today, Lord. God, we, we understand, Lord, that everything, you, everything that you're doing, Lord, is for our benefit, God. So, God, we take the bad with the good this morning, Lord. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. We ask you to bless uh, the Bethel family this morning. God, we give you praise. We give you honor, God, that you left us right here in the land of the living. So we thank you this morning, Lord. We ask you to bless the man of God that will come break the bread of life this morning, Lord. Let him speak into our soul. Let him speak into our, our spirit this morning, Lord. And we thank you this morning, God, and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, we do pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome morning. to the house of God. Amen. Amen. So glad to be in the Lord's presence today. Amen. Uh, this morning, I want to start off with an invocational scripture, and then we're going to go to our praise and worship. We thank Minister Benjamin for leading us in that time of preparatory prayer so that our hearts would be fixed to worship in the right spirit. I'm going to read from the 91st Psalm. I'm going to read from the 91st Psalm and I'll read from the King James Version. The 91st Psalm, starting at verse 1, and it says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noise of pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers, and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth that noonday. Right. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Right. Only with thine eyes shall thou behold, and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. Thank you, Lord. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways, they shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Yes. Yes. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him you, and show him my salvation. Hallelujah. And the Lord bless the reading and the hearing Amen. of his holy word. Welcome to the Bethel Church of Christ Holiness. Let's now enjoy the Lord with a time of worship through music. Let's say amen. 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 Come on and sing his praise song. 
song along with me and let's give thanks unto the Lord. For he is good. Yeah. Amen. He's good. He is good. So clap your hands. And, you know, you want to do a little dance and just, you know, right where you are, it's all right. Let's just praise the Lord for a few moments.
Praise the Lord. Not where we are this morning. We are living sanctuaries for the Lord. Amen. So we empty out ourselves and we give him the praise, the honor, and the worship that he is due. Amen. Whatever our worldly concerns are this morning, we suspend them for this hour's period of time so that we might give God new glory. Amen. Just a couple of reminders for you. This Sunday, um, Washington Memorial Church of Christ Holiness is celebrating their 71st church anniversary, and that's at 3 p.m. right around the corner here, 4361 South McKinley. So we remember them as they uh, celebrate God's working through their ministry for 71 years. Let's also remember that next Sunday we are invited to the Bethlehem Church of Christ Holiness for their 73rd uh, church anniversary. Their 73rd, and that's in Pasadena, 1550 North Fair Oaks. So we look forward to that. Um, I believe also on this Sunday during this service, so right now, uh, Mount Olive is celebrating an anniversary service. So we want to remember them in prayer as they celebrate during their 11 a.m. worship hour. Amen. Um, I don't believe I'm missing any announcements, but if I, oh, what a, a big announcement that I'm missing is for the next few Wednesdays, I won't be able to make 7 p.m. for the uh, midweek Bible study. Now, I'm going to post this in multiple places. What I'd like to try to do um, is choose an alternate day. So I think what I'd like to try to do is make that day Tuesday. I was going to make it Thursday, but I know there's some prayer that happens on Thursday, and I don't want to step on that. So Tuesday, I believe, would be a good alternate day. So Tuesday, this Tuesday, starting this Tuesday night, and again, we'll post it uh, as many places as we need to, but starting this Tuesday night, we are going to uh, have Bible study. Uh, and we're going to keep it on that night for the foreseeable future, just to steer clear of other things. So 7 p.m., same time. Everything else is the same except the time is the day. The day is changing, which is Tuesday. So Tuesday, 7 p.m., Tuesday, 7 p.m. Looking forward to seeing you there if you can make it. Amen. Um, I think that's it for announcements. Uh, I want to continue to remember the families in prayer that have asked for prayer. Um, that would be Wendell Jones from his mother, Rochelle, and the loss of their loved one, Gary, uh, who will be late to rest next Saturday at 11 a.m., I believe, next Saturday at 11 a.m., right here at the uh, Bethel Church here in Los Angeles. So we're praying for that family. We're praying for all families who have suffered loss in whatever period of time, and you're still uh, processing that, folding that into your life. We're praying for God's consolation and peace on your life. For those of you who are praying because you are in some way afflicted, you are sick, we are praying with you. I know of numerous uh, different afflictions, joint things, um, back pain, um, others are dealing at some stage with cancer, um, and there are a number of other things that people are dealing with. We are praying with and we're praying for you. The fervent effectual prayer of the righteous availeth much. So we want to remember to pray for as many people as we can as they come to your heart and your mind. Again, we remind you during the week to set aside some time to pray for those people that you know are in need of prayer. Amen. All right, we're going to go to the throne room at this time. I want you to go up with me. Whatever I fail to mention, the power of our numbers is that you will capture that in your prayer and your petition. Let's go to the Father now. Father, we thank you for your loving kindness and your grace towards us, your tender mercies this particular day. God, this is a day that you have made, and we have instructed our own selves to rejoice and be glad in it. Often we give you a sacrifice of praise because it's not based on our emotions or our feelings or the way we view our lives, how good or, or positive or negative and awful the outcomes. Lord, it's really all about your grace. Your grace is sufficient. And whatever hour we are in, your grace is sufficient. Whatever season, your grace is sufficient. Throughout all circumstances, God, your favor follows us. And you do as you promise to do. Weapons formed against us don't prosper. You supply our need. We are never truly walking alone because you promised to always be with us and to never forsake us. We have the comfort of your promises and all of them according to scripture are yea and amen and we affirm that with our own lives. You are true to your promise. God, you have kept us. You have watched over us and you have protected us and we are thankful. We are thankful for the grace that you show us. We don't deserve your love and yet you continue to abundantly pour it upon us. So we just want to take out this time, God, to express our gratitude, 
our gratitude for your mercy and your grace, not only on us, but people around us, God. We are grateful. We are grateful for how your love manifests itself in our life and how your power, how your power courses through our lives day to day. God, every day, every day, your mercies are new. Great is your faithfulness to us. And we're here to testify of that. As we move forward in the service, Father, certainly there are those that we know are in need. Uh, outside of ourselves, we understand the power of our prayer to impact and influence change on in other people's lives. And God, we have people around us who need change in their lives. There are people who are sick. Lord, I mentioned just a few of the many afflictions that your people suffer, God. But we know that you are able to heal the body, he who created the body. And so we're praying that that would happen. Rather, it be through a, a divine miracle, God, or a miracle of medicine, of science, of surgery. However you deploy that blessing, God, bless those who are in pain, in comfort, whose bodies are dysregulated in some way. God, make the difference in their situation. There are those who are praying for relationship issues, God. You know what all those issues are. You know how close those relationships are to them and what needs to happen for reconciliation to take place. And we're praying, God, that that would happen in our lives, that parents and children would be reconciled, that uh, spouses would be reconciled, that siblings and friends would be reconciled, God. We know that earthly relationships are important to you. We know that we cannot declare that we love you if we do not love one another. And we know that we are identified as your disciples by how we love one another. God, help us to love. Help us to love without condition. Help us to love without constraint or restriction. God, lead us. Guide us. As you fill us with your Holy Spirit, may that Spirit produce love in us. In the name of Jesus. God, you know what all these situations are whether they be of affliction or whether they be of some need for relationship mending, whether they be uh, a need for God for uh, some relief from the stresses that we face in life, some financial situations, job-related, school-related, others-related. Father, you know what our circumstances are, and we see you showing up at the point of our need and demonstrating your power in our lives, but also through our lives. Others can see the good works that are happening in us and glorify you, our Father, which are in heaven. God, that's our desire that our entire lives be a ministry. Our entire lives be a ministry that folks be able to look upon us in our circumstances and situations and the way that we respond to the environment around us and see you, see your power, see, see your grace, see your love. May we be instruments to be used by you. As we go further in this service, Father, we want to be free to worship and to praise where there is sin in our lives, where there are uh, loads that we are carrying, burdens that we are carrying in our lives. We pray, God, that you would forgive us of the sin and then give us strength and wisdom to lay aside the weights, the loads that do so easily beset us. God. We want our, our path to be clear and unobstructed God, by unnecessary things. And so we lay aside those unnecessary things. There are some things we touched we shouldn't have. God, we pray your forgiveness. There are some thoughts we've hosted that we shouldn't have. We pray your forgiveness. Some places we've gone, some appetites we've fed. God, you know where we have fallen short. And we just want to be honest with you this morning and acknowledge those sins. Acknowledge those shortcomings and pray your forgiveness in our lives. And we receive that forgiveness in the name of Jesus. God, we have been liberated from sin. We have been liberated from destruction. And you have counseled us to no longer walk in it, God. And that's our desire, to walk as free people. God, be our strength, be our guide. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Thank God. Thank God. Amen. 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 I want to remind you of giving. Remind you of your digital giving through Zell and Venmo. For those of you who are not in the building or even in the building, so as many of you are giving digitally too. Um, Zell Venmo used the church's email address, BethelCOCH at gmail. Uh, we also want to remind you that we do have Cash App. We do have Cash App, so if Cash App is easier for you, dollar sign BethelCOCH. And then finally, if you are going to mail it, please remember to mail it to our PO box, and I don't have it written in slipped in my mind, but um, call the church if you need more information. Amen? 11664. It's 11664. P.O. Box 11664. Thank you. P.O. Box 11664. 
11664. That's the same area code, 90011. That's the church. Amen. All right. Um, I think I've been I've done all that I was supposed to do before the message and song. Somebody help me if I didn't. All right. Um, we are going to be in the book of 1 Corinthians today. We're going to have a message and song here shortly, but I want to get you set up so we can go right into the word. Good to see all of those of you who are here with us physically. Glad to have those of you who are with us here virtually. Also, um, so we are in the book of 1 Corinthians. We're going to be in chapter 12. And we're going to look at verses 12 through 18 for context, but our message comes from the 18th verse. Our message comes from the 18th verse. This morning talking about the health of the body. Praise the Lord. We're going to have our message and song at this time from Sister Precious Michael. Let's say amen for her.
We have to remember that. We have to remember that. Sometimes you have to just praise your way through. Isn't that right, Sister Turner? Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise your way through. Because God is good. And it's useful for us to intentionally just reflect. Sometimes it's just good to sit somewhere quiet. No television. No social media. Uh, no idle conversation with people around. Just you and the Lord in some quiet reflective space and just start to inventory how God has been good in your life. Just start to count the blessings as the song says. And start with the small things. You won't struggle hard if you start with the small things. Woke up this morning a reasonable portion of health. Food in my cupboard. Roof over my head. Shoes on my feet. Amen. Uh, I was able to come to, to worship, uh, voice my worship. God's given me a right mind. I got my loved ones around me. In fact, I would just start to count my loved ones. Children, grandchildren, spouse, friends, neighbors, co-workers, study mates. Just start to name all the people around you that love you and all the people you love back. The further you get into that inventory, I guarantee you, the right of your spirit will become. Regardless of all the other stuff that's going on, when you start to count your blessings, it's really when the grace of God begins to manifest. Because guess what? Somebody else wishes they have had what you have. So we are blessed. Amen? Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. For as the body is one, verse 12, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now have God set the members, verse 18, <clears throat> but now has God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. As it hath pleased him. Today let's talk about the life and health of the body. Father, we thank you for your grace again today. And as we go into this priest word for the next few minutes, Father, I pray your Holy Spirit would minister to all of our hearts. Encourage us, direct us where necessary, correct us, so that we might walk in the image of your dear Son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 18. Paul here is apparently, very clearly, responding to questions or issues in the church uh, or among the members of the church at Corinth regarding gifts. And we know that in the world in which they lived, in Roman culture overall, and the Christians who were coming to conversion during that first generation of the church, there were a lot of debates about gifts. Debates about who would get which gifts. By the way, debates we still have today. Something like, can women minister, for instance? That's one of the debates, right? So there were debates then, debates about which gifts were better than which others. Is the gift of prophecy superior to the gift of uh, being an evangelist? Is that superior to the gift of being a pastor, a teacher? Is healing superior? Or is speaking in tongues superior? Which are the superior gifts, if any? There was a debate about that. And Paul's weighing in on that. Who should receive them and what are the gifts for? His emphasis is that 
Spiritual gifts don't make us spiritual. Listen, spiritual gifts don't make us spiritual. The Holy Spirit makes us spiritual. One can have a divinely assigned gift and yet be carnal. How many singers do we know who sing like angels and live like demons? How's that possible? How can they produce such heart striking notes and yet be so full of darkness and venom? Well, it's because our gifts come without repentance. Getting the gift doesn't require that we be truly walking in faith. It sets us up. It sets us up so that once we do enter the kingdom, it gives us a position in the kingdom, a place to be. Not a rank, but a place to be. We'll talk about that in a few mo moments. Every believer is spiritual because of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And that's really Paul's point in verse 13 when he says, For by one spirit uh, are we all baptized into one body. The achievement of that oneness is based on us being filled with the spirit. Now, even as I consider this and think about this, and I'm, I'm sharing this with you, I really believe that this is a response to the idea that we are most comfortable with people who are like us. Educated people want to assemble with educated people. Less educated people feel more comfortable with other less educated people. They feel less judged. Black people want to be with black people. Brown people want to be with brown people. White people want to be with white people. And even in the world, studies show that little girls do better in school when they're in the class with just other little girls. They just do better. There's something about us that yearns for belonging to a tribe. And we define, not only do we belong to a tribe, but we like to belong to tribes that are superior to other tribes. So I like to find a group that's doing better than other groups and say, I'm a member of that group. And because that group is superior, then I'm superior. Church, understand how this works among, amongst us, right? I'm a preacher. Because I'm a preacher, I'm walking at a higher level and a higher order than people who are not preachers. So I'm special. I have a special seat when I come into the sanctuary. When we eat food, I have a special place that I eat my food. And in fact, when I'm feeling real special, I have them make food for me that's just for the preachers. Because preachers are superior in the kingdom. I know this ain't popular among people, but that's the truth of it. We think about ourselves in terms of ranks, right? I could not be a preacher and be expected to sit on the same row, Sister Annette, as an usher. Because I'm a preacher. And of course, everybody knows preachers are superior. We have a superior gift in the church. Church couldn't exist without us. Church could exist without some of you, but the church can't exist without us. Now, what I'm doing is I'm using a rhetorical device here. I'm saying something affirmatively that I do not believe. I do not believe preachers have a superior gift. What I'm voicing is the thoughts of many, not just among preachers, but some of y'all think that preachers have a superior gift. And so you treat us accordingly. It's what ends up being hero worship in the church, where we lift the person so high that they almost walk on water. And then we're torn apart when we find out that, oh, they're actually human beings with weaknesses and flaws, like all human beings. It happens because we are elevating gifts and not the giver. Paul wants us to know what makes us spiritual is not our gifting, nor the expertise with which we walk in it, but it's being filled with the Holy Ghost. And because the oneness created among us is based on all of us being filled with the same spirit, as my mother would say, there are no 
big eyes and little U's. We're all the same in God's eyes. Y'all with me today? Amen. That's the macro point or the major point that Paul is making here. He goes on to say to us that um, every believer is given a gift. Those gifts should be used in the context of the church. And then he says the church is like a body. This goes to anybody who would argue that going to church, in air quotes for those who can't see me, going to church is not necessary today. I can get my church on TV when I get it, any day during the week. Uh, I can worship the Lord on my own. I don't need other people to worship the Lord. I do not need to belong to an organized religious effort. That's old fashioned. That's, that's myth. God doesn't really require that. Well, Paul is saying something quite the opposite. He's saying the church is like a body. It's the body that provides the context in which our gifts should be used. Our gifts are given to be used in the body. And so when Paul teaches this, not just here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, but in a moment, I'm going to show you in Romans chapter 12. When Paul is teaching this, it's to say to us that we need each other. Amen. We need each other. Amen. Those who walk through this life as believers, thinking that they can do so alone, are walking in ignorance. To walk in ignorance is to walk in darkness. God has called us to the light. We need one another. I'll say it one more time for the cheap seats in the back. We need one another. Romans chapter 12, verse 4. Romans chapter 12, verse 4 says, For just as in one body we have many members, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body, so we who are many are one body, e pluribus unum, out of many one. So we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. And individually we are members one of another. We're connected. Verse 6, and having, Romans 12, 6, and having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, and having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the portion of our faith, or service, let us be faithful in that service, or he who teaches in that teaching, verse 8, or he who exhorts in that exhortation, he who gives in simplicity, he who leads in diligence, he who shows mercy in cheerfulness. We serve with ready spirits within the context of the body. What body? The body of Christ. The health of the body of Christ requires that we have the function of all of the members of the body. If you are lost in what I'm saying, let's think about your body. If I asked you right now, what part of your body are you willing to have removed? I don't think you would answer that question quickly. Because if you are mentally stable, you don't want nobody moving nothing on your body uh, electively. Amen. You want to keep everything on your body because you feel like you need everything on your body, even when you don't completely understand how everything works on your body. You want everything in your body. Don't go in my body and take nothing out unless it's absolutely necessary. Why? Because I understand, though I don't necessarily know the function of every part. Every part functions and every part is needed. And I can't give you anything because God didn't give me nothing extra. I need everything in this body. It's the same way in the church. We are the body of Christ. And we need everything in the body to be working. Because all of us have experienced, if we've lived long enough... All of us have experienced when things in the body didn't work. And we know what that does to the body. The baby toe is called the baby toe because it's so small. And I don't think a person in this room can think of something specific you need the baby toe for. But let you stub and hurt that baby toe. It's not just the baby toe that hurts. The whole body feels that pain. And when I see you walking from the outside, while I did not see you hit your toe on something... I can tell that something happened to your body by the way your body is moving. How is it that we think is different in the church? When a body part is moving, when not every part of the body is functioning, 
How do we think it's different? Doesn't it impact the mobility of the body? The ability of the body to move forward, to grow and to develop when there are parts of the body that aren't working? Hey Amen. I got excited on that. I felt that in my soul. What's important to understand is that our gifts determine our position and our special purpose within the body. Our gifts help us determine. Some of us don't know where we ought to be. That is not me indicting you or trying to make you feel guilty. It's just a statement of reality. All of us, all of us have been in a situation where we were someplace, but we didn't exactly know where we ought to be. We were told to show up somewhere for something. We got there. We got to the general place okay, but now you're standing in the parking lot trying to figure out where do I go from here. Again, that is an analog that is similar to where we are spiritually sometimes. I know that I'm supposed to be in the church, but I'm not quite sure how I'm of the church. Where do I belong in the body? What should I be doing? When? And how? And how am I to be held accountable for making sure I do that? Sometimes we don't know the answers to these questions. And typically, when we don't know the answers to these questions, we don't know how we fit in with the body of Christ. We can come to church, quote unquote, sit in the pews, hear a good sermon, and feel good about it, feel like it benefits our lives directly. But what we don't altogether understand is how do we now make a con contribution? That's something more than a financial contribution. And have I been called to do something more than give my money and my presence to the body? Yes, we have all been called to do something more than give our money and our presence to the body. God has given us all gifts, and we are to use those gifts according to the scripture, according to our faith. Our gifts determine our position and operational pur purpose in the body. Everybody can't see because not everyone has the gift of vision. Everybody can't see because not everybody has the gift of vision. Everybody can't move the body because not everyone is a foot. But the foot and the eye must work together to ensure the right paths and directions are taken to get the body to its next destination. I'll say it again. The foot and the eye have to work together to get the body to its next destination. I can walk on my hands, but it's not the optimal way for me to move. Right. I'm going to say that one again. I can walk on my hands, but it's not the optimal way for me to move. There is something I'm supposed to be doing. And if I'm not doing that, then I'm not doing good in the body. The hands were not made for walking. The hands were made for grasping. The hands were made for holding. The feet were made for moving. And if the body's going to move, then the feet need to do what the feet were made to do. If I'm going to try to live my life walking on my hands, I'm not going to walk very much and I'm not going to walk very far because my arms and my hands were not made for walking. If you haven't got what I'm talking about yet, if you're doing something in the body or doing nothing in the body, then the body has been severed from one of its functions. And what do you think happens to a body when it's severed one of its functions? Well, what happens to your body when all of a sudden you only got one arm? What happens to your body when all of a sudden you only got one eye? What happens to your body when all of a sudden you have one leg? The other members have to adapt. And they do, and life goes on, but there is a huge inconvenience to that body. And then there become some things that body can never ever do anymore because one of the functions have been severed. Yes, we'll still move along. Yes, we'll still get things done. Yes, we'll find a way to have a quality life, but we can never optimize the ministry because we got somebody in the body who's been severed from the body. I'm going to get to verse 18 in a moment, but I got to help us understand the impact of not being in the position that God has called us to. When any one of us are slack concerning God's calling in our lives, when any one of us have not decided to put the application, the gift that God has given us, it impacts all of us. A one-legged man can live a quality life, but he'll never run the great races of the world because he only has one leg. Amen, somebody. 
The focus of this is verse 18. Paul drives home the point that the body parts don't choose their jobs. The body parts don't choose. I didn't get to choose to be a preacher because if it was my choice, it never would have happened. I never wanted it. And if I'm fully transparent with you today, there's still some times in my life I resent God for calling me to the ministry. I would have rather do anything else. I would have been an excellent usher. I would have been a great choir member, as long as you stand me way in the back where most people don't hear me. I would have done anything gladly rather than be a preacher. But I didn't get to do what I wanted to do. God has placed me in the body as it pleases him. And because I have been responsive, because I've been respectful, because I've been obedient to the call of God on my life, my life has taken a particular course that it would not have taken had I not been functioning in the body as God has called me to do. I wish somebody under the sound of my voice who is currently out of place, I wish you would be inspired to get in place by the testimony that when you do that, God begins to align your life in a special way. And things start happening outside of your human efforts. God opens doors that you didn't even know were there. Amen. Do you know there's some rooms in the world where you're walking through a hallway and you don't even recognize there was a door there? It doesn't look like a door. It doesn't look like something you walk through. But all of a sudden, you'll be walking through a hall. Somebody will pop out of the wall. You'll be like, where they come from? They're coming through a door that you didn't even know existed. God has those doors in our lives. We don't see them. We don't know they're there. But God knows when we need them to be opened and God alone opens them. Why? Because we are where he has placed us in the body. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Turn your neighbor and say, get in position. Amen. Turn your neighbor and say again, don't talk to me too much because COVID is still real. <laughs> Amen. I heard somebody say it actually. Somebody said it. God has placed us in the body as it pleases him. He placed each body part in the best place on the body to do its work. He gave each body part the exact job for which it was designed. Those parts are meant to work in harmony. When certain parts refuse to work, the body cannot function as it was designed to function. Anybody ever have a body part that's doing stuff you didn't ask it to do? Or that's failing to do what you've asked it to do? Anybody have a, have a body part that failed? Yeah. I've had my legs fail. Right. I've had my arm fail. Yeah. I woke up one morning, October 2012, and could not lift my head from the pillow because my neck had failed. I was lying, literally, face down in the pillow, feeling like I was about to suffocate, and could not lift my own head. It is devastating. It is devastating when your body stops working the way it's supposed to. If you've ever had cancer, you know it's devastating when your systems become dysregulated and start doing things that they're not supposed to do. God has formed us, each one of us, individually to be a body part. And then the scripture goes on to tell us that we are members one of another. That is to say, not only are you a part of the body, but you need to be connected to the body. There are lots of Christians who have what they call para ministries. They're not doing anything in their local body, but they've decided to go out on their own and just do this, this whole independent ministry on their own because they want the liberty and the freedom to do what they want to do. That's fine, but it's against the design for the body. We all ought to be connected to one another, and God is never pleased when we're disconnected. Certainly, he's never pleased when we decide by ourselves that we are going to sever ourselves from the body. I'm going to help another pastor this morning who has a member who's going to hear this message either now or in the future. I believe this in my soul. I want somebody to hear this. You are thinking about leaving your church. Because you don't like the way things are done. It's not that somebody's doing wrong or sinning. It's just that you don't like the setup. Or, or you feel like some folks leave because they say, I don't feel like I'm getting fed there. Here is what I want you to understand. 
we don't get to be where we want to be. Man. We need to be where God has called us to yeah. be. Yeah. There is a place that God has called yeah. us to. Now, there are some folks who will hear this sermon and say, well, you're eisegete, not exegete, preacher. When God calls us to the body, it simply means he's given us a gift, and there are certain places in the kingdom where that gift works best. No, I'm exegete, preacher, because the Bible says that when he calls us to the body, he connects us to one another. Well, if God has designed this body, and he's designed this body so that we work together collaboratively in harmony. It stands to reason that God knows who I work best with. And he's going to put me in a place that optimizes the gift that he's put in me. And he doesn't trust me to make that decision independent of him. Because the Bible says as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the children of God. So how can I be a child of God led by the spirit of God making decisions independent from God? Sometimes I got to be even where I don't want to be. Ask Gideon. Ask Moses. Ask Abraham. Sometimes I got to be where I don't want to be doing things I'd rather not do. But when God calls me to a task, that becomes the optimum objective in my life to complete what God has called me to. God places me in the body as it pleases him. And finally this. For the body to be healthy. Not only does it matter that all of its parts function correctly. And that the parts are working cooperatively with each other. And they are connected in fellowship and in relationship. But I want to talk to you about the configuration and the size of body parts. What happens is when we are existing disconnected from one another, kind of doing our, our own thing over here and over there. Have you ever seen a bodybuilder with an incredible upper body with puny legs? You know how funny that looks. When the body is disproportionate like that, it naturally strikes you as being wrong. There's not something right with that picture. But the concern we have is that in the body of Christ, there are parts of the body that are overfed and other parts of the body that are under. Some parts of the body are getting more nourishment than others. And it's as pro, it, is pro, it is as problematic to be overfed as it is to be underfed. If anyone, I've struggled with too much upper body weight. I've struggled with too much upper body weight. My frame is made for no more than about 175, 176 pounds. At 177 pounds and above, I will start to have back problems. It's how I always know I've gained some weight. Without fail, the moment I feel that certain back problems, very specific problem, the moment I feel it, I can step on a scale and I guarantee you I'm over 176 pounds. Because my body is designed for a certain amount of weight and to have that weight distributed a certain way. When my upper body gets too full, my frame or my core cannot carry it. A weak core results in back problems. And that makes me less mobile because it hurts to move. Y'all gonna catch up in a moment. Similarly, if my core is strong, I'm toned, I'm muscular, I got a six pack, Nice chest, big arms, but I've done no work on my legs. It's still going to be a problem. Because while I have a nicely toned core, my legs cannot bear its weight. So now I've got knee problems. And that's going to impact my mobility. There are problems we have in the body 
that cause us to suffer internally. It is not visible to everyone the suffering that's going on, but it is going on. Anybody ever has in your life trigger warning? Trigger warning. Anybody have anybody in your life who passes suddenly? And it makes no sense until you get the cause. And then you understand that there was a silent killer living in their body. It happens to men and women, right? Very often there are heart problems that go undiagnosed for years. And the problem worsens to the point where the body can no longer be sustained. But up until the moment that person passes, that person looks like the picture of health. There was never any external evidence that there was an internal problem. You can never look at that person and go, you need to go see the doctor or there's something wrong with you. They can still run fast. They can still jump high. They were still carrying on the routine task of their lives. They were as happy as they'd ever been and functional as they'd ever been. They go to bed one night and don't wake up the next morning. And you ask yourself what happened. One dear sister of ours was in her front yard. She was actually someone who let other people in exercises. She, uh, she was into one of these cardio programs, and she was actually a coach for the program. And we all saw her as the picture of health. She was in her front yard, and we're not talking about older people. We're talking about people who are in their 30s and their 40s that this happens to. Why? And it's so tragic when it happens and, and it breaks our heart that a young life is snuffed out. But we have to understand that sometimes we have internal problems. It's why you and I go to the doctor routinely to have them do those tests. And we, we have them draw blood from our arms and they do all kinds of tests to look into our bodies to determine if there's anything wrong going on in our body. Because not everything produces external evidence or at least external evidence that's recognizable by those of us who are untrained. We are calling the, the, the people of Christ a body. And Paul gives that, that analogy on purpose because it's perfectly applicable to who we are as the church. Think of ourselves as a body. And when you look at that body, you can't just evaluate how healthy it is by what's going on on the outside. Certainly when there are symptoms of affliction on the outside, then those things can be addressed. But we also got to know that sometimes you need a deeper checkup. Because there are all, almost always some things going on on the inside that if they go untreated will lead to long and lasting damage. Hypertension. Diabetes. This is what I'm saying to us today. There is a small gland in your body. All of us have it. It's called the pituitary gland. And it sits at the base of your brain. And it's literally the size of a pea. But it regulates the major systems of your body. It's, it's almost like a scheduler for certain hormones to be secreted that are necessary to keep the regular functions of your body going. Now until I just told you where that was, you may have said, I've heard about the pituitary gland, but if I said point to it, you may not have been able to point to it. And even now that I've described it, you still may not be able to point to it. Why? Because it's not something that any of us thinks about on a regular basis. And if I were to ask you the question today, if I were to ask you the question today, what's the most important part of your body? The answer probably wouldn't be the pituitary gland. And yet, without it, you cannot live. And when it's dysregulated, when it's not working like it's supposed to, then your body will not grow. And your body will not develop. And your body will not maintain strength. We all need our pituitary gland. But just because I said that, does that make that the most important gland in your body? Because I just described how important it is? Would you sacrifice your eyes for your pituitary gland? Would you sacrifice, probably more to the point, your heart? Would you sacrifice your brain? Aren't those things also necessary? Isn't vision also necessary for an optimal life? Here's my point. We look at things and we determine what is more or less important. 
In the body of Christ, we are all important. And when any one of us is not functioning by design, it impacts all of us. And sometimes that impact is not readily visible. But if we do a deep examination on our own body, we'll begin to see that there are parts not functioning. And as a result, the body is not mobile. It does not grow, it does not develop, and it does not get stronger. And that will not happen until the body is functioning the way it was supposed to be designed. So Paul is in a very real way saying here, forget about your silly conversations about what gifts are more important than what other gifts. Forget about your silly notions about people being anointed because they operate with expertise in their giftings. You can be an outstanding songster or songstress and still be on your way to hell, breaking it open at breakneck speed. None of that matters. What matters is that we're doing what God called us to do, wait for it, where God told us to do it. And we don't get to make those decisions independent of God. When it comes to the kingdom work, God's not asking you what you want. He's asking you, are you available? You don't get the vision. You don't understand my master plan. You're a small part of an ages long plan to bring humanity back to its creator. Do your part. God puts us in the body as it pleases him. And then he commands us, do your part. Will we function where God called us to? How God calls us to? Not only does the body of Christ benefit, but your body will benefit. Yeah. There are choice blessings given to God's obedient children. God has told us in this word, it was true when he commissioned it to be written, and it's true today. God prefers obedience over our sacrifices. Yeah. He wants a life that's committed to him. And in my conclusion, I'll repeat what I've so often said to, to us. Because it's true. God is not impressed by our abilities. He's God. He's not impressed by our abilities. He's impressed by our availability. He was impressed by Stephen's availability. As Stephen got stoned for standing up for the gospel, the Bible says Christ stood up in the throne room. Out of respect, out of honor for this man who made himself available to the ministry of the gospel. He stood up out of respect. God is not impressed by our abilities. But by our availability. I don't care Moses. That you stutter when you talk. I don't care that you're not the most articulate. And rousing spokesperson. I gave you some stuff to say. Go say it. I'm responsible for the rest. I'll send the plagues. I'll move Pharaoh. I'll move him. I'll take care of that. It's not your job. It's above your pay grade. Just do what I ask you to do. And so I'm encouraging us today. When we look around us, no matter what church you go to, this or any other church, you look around you and you go, I don't see stuff happening here. That, what is your job? What has God called you to do? What is your station? What is your bodily function? And are you doing what God called you to do? Because if you're not, although you see the problem, what you don't see is that you're part of the problem. Father God, we thank you for your grace this hour, your tremendous favor that you show us. As our hearts are receiving this word today, God, may it find a resting place that we might not sin against you. Help us to examine our own selves individually, whether we be in your will. And if we are not in your will, God, we repent. We repent. Because we have committed a sin of omission. We have not been doing what we were supposed to do. And God, we know that too breaks your heart. We ask for strength, grace, and wisdom to find our individual place in the body and then to connect with the other members of the body 
so we can bring about together the outcomes that you have ordained us to, the saving of souls, reconciliation of hum humanity back to its creator, speaking life and health and prosperity and joy and peace and love into the lives of others. God, place us in the body as it pleases you and then help us to find our place. That's our prayer. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you under the sound of my voice and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, I'm asking you to come today. I'm asking you to come today. I'm trusting that God said things to you that I failed to mention. That the sermon you heard this morning was delivered by the Holy Spirit. And that in your heart, there is that message that God is calling you to respond to. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, that was the call today. Come to Jesus. You have a place in his body. And he needs you functioning there. If you have made that decision for Christ, I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now. And then I'm going to give you some instructions to help you start your life in Christ. I need you to pay attention. And when I pray, if you believe the words that I'm saying, I need you to repeat them aloud if you can. Mouth them if you can. As you pray this prayer of repentance and acceptance of Jesus Christ as Savior just now. Father, we thank you for your loving kindness. Lord, I come to you as a sinner. Someone who's not been walking in faith or living a life of faith. I know that you want me to be your child. That you created me to be that. But I've been living outside of your presence. I want to come home. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. Who died to save me from eternal damnation. Who rose again after death to take back the power of life so that I might experience everlasting life. I believe that Jesus died for me. I believe that he was resurrected from the dead and that I, now he sits with you in heaven. I believe his death paid for my sins. I believe his resurrection gives me the gift of eternal life. I receive Jesus as my Lord to lead and guide me as my Savior to reconcile me back to you, Father. I want to come home. I am sorry for my sinfulness. I have not been doing what you designed me to do. I'm sorry for my sinfulness. I have done things you commanded I do not do. Lord, forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from their unrighteousness. Fill me with your spirit so I can recognize your voice. That's my prayer. I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. I'm a saint. I'm a child of God. I am saved. I am saved. I am saved. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you pray that prayer with me and you truly believe that you've given your, Lord, your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, I need you to find someone now in your life, someone that you know also loves Jesus and is serving Jesus, is going to a Bible-believing Christ-teaching church, and I need you to find that person immediately. I need you to reach out and tell them the decision you just made. Ask them to help you begin your journey in Christ, to find a good church. If you're struggling with that, please contact, contact us here at the Bethel Church of Christ Holiness. Bethel, C-O-C-H, at gmail.com. Bethel, C-O-C-H, at gmail.com. Reach out on any of our social media platforms, YouTube, uh, Facebook live stream. Try to get a hold of us. We want you to be grafted in, to come into the household of faith the right way. And you need a church to support that growth. To all of you who joined us today, God bless you and God keep you. Thank you for joining us on this day. We pray you have a beautiful, a beautiful week. And if we don't see you on this side, we'll see you on the other side. Remember, Tuesday night Bible study. Tuesday, Tuesday. We're changing the night. Tuesday, 7 p.m. Tuesday. God bless you. Thank those of you on the teleconference for joining us. God bless you. Have a great day. Amen.
Great message. Uh, bless you, sir. How you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm okay. Family's doing okay? Family's good. Just have the transportation problem. So you got about that's another loaner car out there, the great one? That's my daughter. But pray for me. No longer draw it our prayer. Bless Brother Benjamin to get the service because I want to be here. All right. Uh, you're still doing the detailing? Uh, off and on. Off and on, yeah. Okay. So. I'm going to pray for you, my man. Thank you, sir. I think. Uh, I, need, uh, I need you up here in the, up in, in the music group about two seconds. Me? Okay. Yeah, I need you. Real quick.